Приветствую вас, братья и сестры. Христос воскрес! Христос воскрес! Христос воскрес! В это воскресенье мы продолжаем праздновать этот великий праздник, праздник Пасхи. Мы вспоминаем те страдания, которые прошел Господь ради нас, когда Он был на Голгофе, на кресте и смотрел на каждого из нас и сказал, «Очень прости им, они не знают, что делают». Он умер за каждого из нас, и от этого мы имеем великую возможность собираться в церквах, учить про Бога и иметь это отношение с Ним. И скажем Богу, слава Богу за это. Сегодня я буду проповедовать от, от Евангелия, от книги от Луки, 24 главе, от 10 по 12 стихах. То были Магдалина, Мария и Иоанна, и Мария, мать Якова, и другие с ними, которые сказали о сём апостолам. И показались им слова их пустыми, и не поверили им. Но Петр, встав, побежал к гробу, и, наклонившись, увидел только пелены лежащие, и пошёл назад, дивясь сам себе происшедшему. Я назвал сегодня тему моей проповеди «Встань и пойди». Потому что очень часто в нашей жизни Бог призывает нас, чтобы мы встали и пошли. То ли это встали и пошли за Ним, или пошли рассказать кому-то Евангелие, или делать какое-то дело. Бог призывает, чтобы мы встали и пошли. И как верными христианами мы должны встать И, пойти. и от этого текста мы берем пример, о котором я хотел сегодня очень коротко поделиться. Я буду сегодня говорить по-английски. Good, eve, uh, good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, I'd like to wish each and every one of you a happy Easter and congratulate you with the words, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. And with that, we have a great amount of grace that was given directly from God to us because now we have a chance to be with Him. We have a chance to beat our sinful nature and to spend eternity with Him rather than in eternal punishment. While we celebrate Easter to today, and it's a bit difficult looking and preaching in the pews when they're empty, but we know that we're all gathered together in spirit today. And to many, it might seem difficult, it might seem hard, but in every situation, we need to give thanks to God because there are places and there are people who don't even have the opportunity that we have today. It might be difficult to wake up, roll out of bed, put on your pajamas and drink a little bit of coffee before service and have to watch it on your TV, but others don't have that opportunity. So for everything, we give thanks and glory to God. As I've mentioned earlier today, we're continuing our Easter celebration. We are continuing discussing the things that happened prior to the resurrection, the things that happened at crucifixion and onwards. We have this opportunity to recite and re-remember the gospel story. And today, I would just like to challenge each and every one of us that before we read, before we listen, while the preachers are, are speaking, while the words are being sung, Let's try to take a step backwards. Let's try to imagine the, the context and the atmosphere that is being read about, that is being sung about. Oftentimes when we remember the gospel stories, we tend to set ourselves in an automatic state, meaning we know that Jesus was crucified on this day, Jesus resurrected on this day, the angels appeared to these people, and Jesus ascended to heaven. But in between there, we lose a lot of deep meaning, connection, and lessons that we can learn from each and every person that saw and interacted with Jesus. So today, I'd just like to challenge each one of us to take a step back. Imagine the context, imagine the time, what the people are feeling when these passages are being written and recited. As I've mentioned, we are gonna be preaching today out of Luke chapter 24, verses 10 through 13. I'd like to read that right now. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told them these things to the apostles, but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves, 
and he went home marveling at what had happened. So before we dive into the text, I'd like to give some of that context that I was speaking on earlier. It's now been three days since the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The apostles are gathered together. The apostles are lost. They're confused. They're saddened. They have sorrow in their hearts because they understand the master that they've been following for three years is now dead. We thought you were the Messiah. We thought you were our king. We thought you would save the Jewish nation from our futures. We thought you were the one. But here he is, dead. Imagine the pain the apostles are going through. Imagine the sorrow, the confusion. What happens next? Where do we go? The people know us. They've seen us following him. Will there be persecution on our part? What's going to happen next? Where do we go? What do we do? They're lost. They're confused. I think that if we really want to try to understand and begin to fathom what they're talking about, we can almost relate it to what we're experiencing today. People are lost. People are confused. The coronavirus is wreaking havoc on nations around the world. People are lost and they don't know when this will end, what's going on, how will we interpret the future. Financial institutions are failing. People are losing their jobs. Banks are running out of money. Food is being Food is being scavenged and, and there's things running out. What's going to happen? We can even say that we witnessed the day the world stopped when everyone was forced into quarantine and thus began our story. Many feel lost, confused, and they don't know what's going to happen next. Well, I think in the same way we can relate that to the apostles. Maybe it's a different story, but the emotions are similar and that people are lost and they don't know what's gonna happen and what's going to be next. Now with that context, I'd like to reread chapter 24, verses 10 through 13. The women, I apologize. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles, but these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. The women come back with this great news. They've seen an angel. The Jesus that they once followed is no longer in the tomb. They've seen an angel who has told them that he is no longer there. And they come back to the apostles with this great news. He is alive. They didn't believe them. They thought it was an idle tale. Maybe, maybe the women were hallucinating because they were in such a saddened state that they were seeing things that they wish were true. Maybe it was a dream or something that came to them at night and, and it wasn't really true. It was an idle tale. They didn't believe it. But here's where the interesting story starts. Peter arose and ran to the grave. Now the word used in the original language of the text is that is when the women came and told the good news, Peter didn't even let them finish and he rose and ran with such excitement because if what they are saying is true, this changes everything. In his moment of doubt, in his moment of sadness and agony, in his moment of confusion, Peter runs after God. How many of us need to rise and run after God? How many of us are confused at what's next? How many of us are lost and don't know what's going to happen? How many of us need to stand and rise and run right after God and just believe and go? We need to run and see. Now what do you think was on Peter's mind as he's running? You think he was confused? Do you think he was lost? Do you think he was wondering where he's going and if any of this is true? Do you think he was hopeful? Do you think he was wondering that if this is true, this as a matter of fact changes everything, not only for me, the disciples, but the entire world because somebody has conquered death. Somebody has beat sin and that has changed our lives forever. See that Peter runs. He didn't have all the answers, but he knows where they lie. 
He knows that the answers lie with God and he runs straight after God. Notice that the other apostles sit and stay in confusion and think that, well, this is an idle tale, this isn't true. They're doubting, but Peter runs and goes. How many of us need to leave the people with us who are doubting, who don't believe in God and who don't follow him and, and who believe that all this is an idle tale? Do we challenge ourselves to stand and rise out of our places of comfort and run to follow Jesus as Peter did in this example? Now, the story continues. Peter is running and he approaches the grave and as he reaches the grave, let's take a step back. Where is Peter running? Peter is running to a grave. A grave is arguably one of the most saddest places in this world. They're a place of sorrow, they're a place of grief, they're a place of sadness. You come there with respect. Nobody runs into a grave, nobody yells and shouts when they enter a grave. You come there with respect. What do you think the people were doing when they were looking, what do you think the people around the graves were doing when they look at Peter running in with such energy? How disrespectful. What do you think Peter was thinking at that moment? Peter realizes as he approaches the grave that the first piece of evidence is that the stone on the tomb is gone. Now, I've had the opportunity to visit Israel and depending on which stone this was, the stones can vary in length, but some of the stones can get as big as my arms are in length. These stones are not easily moved. This isn't something that you just press up with your back and push out of the way so that you can get inside. This is a heavy stone. And he notices this piece of evidence because as he approaches this grave, Peter decides to look in. Now, before we continue, imagine that courage or what's going through his mind as he starts to look inside of this grave. Usually, and when I say usually, I mean every human that has ever passed away besides Jesus, their body is still laying there. And after three days and three nights, Nature begins to take its course, and the body begins to turn back into the dust that it came from. The body most likely would have started to rot. The body most likely would have started to crumble. Pieces of flesh would have been missing. The legs were broken. There would have been a stench, more foul than anything you would have ever smelt in your life. But with faith, Peter takes a look inside of this tomb because he believes that Jesus Christ might be risen. And when he looks inside of that tomb, we notice that he finds absolutely nothing. The only thing that Peter finds is the linen cloth, in other gospels write that he finds a folded napkin that was used to wipe the sweat and perspiration off of Jesus. Now, as, as an investigator, as, as somebody who came to investigate the claim that Jesus might be alive, he would immediately think to himself, why were these linen cloths left alone? Now think about it. These cloths were not regular cloths. These were Egyptian linen cloths from Egypt. They were expensive. Not every man would have been buried with something like this. Yet they were left alone. Now why would a robber leave these cloths alone? Why wouldn't he take them with? They'd be far more worth than a, a body would. Now, there's also a secondary point to that. If they would have left the cloth and they would have taken the body, that means they would have taken the body without cloths or without anything. They would have not wanted to touch that body as it is deceased and, and nature is taking its course. As Peter begins to look inside, notice all of these things. He's conducting an investigation. The women come to the apostles and tell them, look, he is no longer there, an angel appeared to us. He gets his first piece of evidence. And he decides to conduct his investigation while running to the tomb, seeing that the stone is empty, the, gra or the stone is moved, the grave is empty, and there's no longer anybody in there. He conducts his investigation and I think that from that example, each one of us can learn something. When we rise, when we run after God, 
We don't just run pointlessly and hopelessly. We conduct our own investigation. We pray ourselves for ourselves. We pray, our, we look ourselves in the gospel to find God. We do everything we can to find God because we're conducting an investigation because if what we are saying and what we have seen and what we have heard is true, then that changes everything. Now, at this point in the story, you would expect Peter to walk out of the tomb and be a new man. He would have believed immediately. He would have taken everything he saw and changed his life completely because Jesus is now risen. That isn't the story that we see. The Bible writes that as Peter comes out of the grave, he went home marveling at what had happened. Now, that means a variety of things. But what it comes down to is Peter was going home and all he could do was think. He didn't know if this was enough. He needed more evidence. He was so confused by what this means, what are these implications, he goes home and he marvels. However, there's also another character here in the scene that perhaps we haven't talked about from the passage of Luke, and that is another man that came with Peter. We know that to be the Apostle John. Now the Apostle John arrives a little bit before Peter, is a bit hesitant to look inside the grave, but decides to look inside of the grave. In chapter 20 of the book of John says that as John looks inside, sees the evidence, John comes out believing. Now that's a very interesting story because that suggests that when two men see the same piece of evidence, it could be enough for one and not enough for the other. Now the point that I'm trying to make here is the fact that sometimes when we see something the same way that somebody else sees it, our body and our mind and our interpretation might be entirely different than that of somebody else's. But Peter didn't stop. He continues to marvel, he continues to search for God, and in the end we know that Jesus reveals himself to Peter and the work that he does for the glory of God is mentioned in Acts and in other books of the Bible. Now, as we come to a close here with this Easter season, I just want to challenge each and every one of us to ask ourselves one question. Are we seeking God or are we pretending to celebrate a resurrected king who we don't believe in? Do we continue to rise, run, and follow God every single day of our lives or has our, has our interpretation been that this is just an idle tale? Have we risen from our peers, our friends, our family who don't believe and stood up and ran to see ourselves? The story of, of Peter truly teaches us a lot. It truly teaches us that in our search for God, each one of us will have a different, a different story, a different path, and different things that we go through. But do we run? and try to find God, investigate God, do everything in our power to find out if these claims are true, or do we simply stay idle? Brothers and sisters, I'd like to challenge us to continue to rise. I'd like to continue, uh, encourage us to continue to search for God, because the gospel message that was present then is present today, and that is that salvation comes through Christ and through Christ alone. So if this is true, then this changes everything. I'd like to challenge us to rise. I'd like to challenge us to run, to do things for the glory of God, to find out if this message is true because it changes everything. We must never give up on our search for God. And when everything is thin and points to God not being there, when you're alone, tired, weary, depressed, and feel like giving up, keep going. God is closer than you think he is. And with that, I'd like to challenge us to pray.